Come gather ye friends round your flickering campfires and listen to tales of daring, horror and high adventure from the worn pages of history. Set aside thine previous spouse to take a new one and gain favour within the Senate. Then don your Lorica segmentata and march with us, your storytellers, as we build an empire. Podcast empire? Have the Hollywood people finally come a-knocking? Full-time, living nanny, here I come! No, you fools, the Roman Empire. This week sees the final part of our Caesar trilogy. Oh, yeah, I remember that broken timeline. Right, let's get that fixed. Who'd have thought me building a time machine out of a cardboard box, then sending Bob Bob back to ancient Rome and bringing Gaius Julius Caesar here to our time would result in such a head and bum swapping catastrophe? Certainly none of us when we started to read the script. The only way to mend the timeline is to retell the story of Caesar. Also, it's a fine excuse to indulge in yet another episode of... The Silly History Boys Show! I am Uncle Bob-Bob. I have travelled through space and time to be here. And now, I'm in your ears. I am Uncle Bilbo, or as the Romans would have called me, Avunculus Bilbobulus. I am the Pear Bear. In a past life, I was an Optio of the Ninth Legion. Probably. I can't remember, really. It was a long time ago. I am Tombo. My trial of Heracles began five months and a few days ago. And will never stop. Last time we ended our tale just as the mighty leader of the Gauls, Vercingetorix, had united the tribes against Caesar and his legions. We pick up the story some time after, in 52 BC, on the morning of the Battle of Jagovia. Right, lads, listen up. That dog, Caesar, has the town of Jergovia under siege. But we've got this here hill. And from here we can ride our horses down and smash him to bits. We better, Verts and Garrix. He's been kicking us up and down the country like a pig's bladder filled with air. Do you mean a ball? Of course he means a ball. That's what he said. No, he didn't. He said a pig's bladder full of air. I just wanted some clarification. Ugh, that's your tribe all over, isn't it? Always wanting clarification on things. Well, that's your tribe all over. Always pointing out stuff of the tribes want. Stop it, stop it. Now's not the time to be fighting amongst ourselves. Oh, oh, right, right. Fighting ourselves. We have a common enemy. I've united us against him. Stop trying to un-unite. They started it. No, we didn't. You did? Stop it! Did you hear that? The Romans have started marching. Now is the time to strike. Prepare for battle! Boy, Terranus, why have you taken all your clothes off? We're getting ready for battle. I think armour would be better. What are you on about? We're wearing our armour. Woad, in it. These blue swirly patterns painted all over us bring us the guard's protection, innit? And show off my incredible abs. Well, of course I knew that. What I'm saying is, perhaps we should think about, you know, armour that's more than just blue paint. And trousers. I think the new rule should be that we always wear trousers. But how will the Romans fear my manliness if they can't see it? Even the last thing a Roman ever sees swinging towards them with deadly intent. I don't think I'm ever going to unsee it. Please, everybody, just... Could you put your trousers back on? Oh, fuck. This is highly irregular, but I'll put my trousers on. Could put them on. on. (sighs) Right, then. Everybody on your horses. Let's show them Romans what we've got. Hooray! No, don't show them... Oh, dear. Trousers or no trousers, the Gauls under Vercingetorix won the Battle of Jagovia decisively, their cavalry smashing into the Roman legionaries and forcing Caesar to withdraw. Why is this part of the story? It's pretty much the only proper victory the Gauls ever had against me. What an awful way to start the final part of my trilogy. Setting the scene, your Caesarus. We wanted the listener to understand that Vercingetorix was a capable commander of men. He wasn't bad, I suppose. 
But I'm way better. Have you told them about Alicia yet? I was getting to it. Get to it faster. By September 52 BC, Caesar had recovered from his defeat at Jagovia. Defeat is a strong word. Temporary reversal of fortunes is more pleasing to my ears. Um, all right. By September 52 BC, Caesar had recovered from his temporary reversal of fortunes at Jagovia. Better. And had forced Vercingetorix and around 80,000 of his warriors to take shelter in the city of Elysia. Caesar had his enemy cornered and knew if he played his cards right, he could finish Vercingetorix off once and for all. Caesar, old boy. Yes, Brutus? Some Gaul flipped through our lines last night on fast horses. Is this true, Mark Antony? I'm afraid so, boss. I reckon that uh, Vercingetorix is trying to get help. Well, we can't be having that, can we? Not a huge amount we can do about it. Not unless we stand the men in a big circle all the way around the city. Have the men build a wall. Where? Around the city. Where around the city, old bean? All the way around it. I want the entire city contravalated. Contraval what now? Entirely enclosed in a wall we've built. A contravalation. That will stop them getting out, won't it? All right, I'll give the order. Oh, you. Yeah, you. Centurion. Yes, you. Come here. Yes, sir. Have the men build a wall all around the city. Yes, sir. Wait. All the way around? Did I mumble, Centurion? Yes. All the way around the city. Right, well, might take a while. Then you best get to it, haven't you? And that is exactly what they did. It took only three weeks for the Romans to build ten miles of wall that completely encircled Elysia. Finished, boss. Them Gauls won't be escaping now. Marvellous. But what about the Gauls everywhere else? Uh, what about them? Don't you think we're a bit exposed here? There could be hundreds of thousands of, of angry Gauls heading here to help Vercingetorix as we speak. That, Brutus, my friend, is a very good point. There's only one thing that we can do. What's that, sir? Circumvallation. What? Circumvallation. Have the men build another wall around the first wall. We'll stay in the middle to keep those Gauls in and the other Gauls out. Oh, yay. I'll give the order. Centurion. Yeah. Yes, you. Yes, I know. Yes, you. What, I need you again. Come here. Centurion, yes, come here. Yes, sir. Have the men build another wall around the first one. What? But, sir, we've only just finished this one. Well, now Caesar wants another wall. Is there a problem with that, Centurion? Oh, no, sir. No problem at all. I mean, it's only an entire wall, isn't it? We'll just bish bash boss that up for you right now. Do you want some watchtowers at regular intervals while we're at it? Well, now I do. Excellent idea, Centurion. Ah. And so, a second wall was built around the first wall. This circumvallation stretched for 13 miles and had watchtowers, trench works and various spiky things designed to keep rampaging Gaulish relief forces at bay. Whilst all the wall building was going on, things in Elysia were starting to look grim. 80,000 warriors, plus a city's complement of women and children, required a lot of food. Food that could no longer reach the city because of the walls. Vercingetorix sent all the women, children and non-combatants out of the city, hoping that Caesar would allow them to pass through the fortifications to safety. Caesar... The Gauls have sent thousands of women and children out of Elysia towards the inner walls. Really? Whatever for? From what I can gather, Vercingetorix is hoping that you'll let them pass through the fortifications we built and head off to safety. Whatever gave them that foolish notion? I think he's hoping that you'll show them some mercy. Hmm. Nah. What was that? That was a no, Mark Antony. I'm not feeling very merciful today. Righto. What should we do with them then, sir? 
Let them starve. Okay. Was there anything else? Yeah, no, not really. Uh, what? Well, just quick, quick idea. What if we? Uh, what if we just kill them now? Because you know, starving takes ages. And have the men be all worn out and tired from hacking defenseless civilians to tiny pieces? <laughs> I think not. No, let them starve. It's one way to go, sir. Who am I to? Doesn't matter. From inside Elysia, Vercingetorix could see that his gambit had failed. There was now only one option left to him. Surrender. He donned his ceremonial armour, leapt atop his horse and rode out to Caesar's camp. Once there, he rode a circle around it before riding to Caesar's tent and dismounting. What's all this? Who are you? I am Vercingetorix. And I am here to surrender. Oh, lovely! I was starting to get bored of watching your women and children starving to death. A bit depressing, really. I shall now surrender in the manner traditional of my people. And how is the... Ooh, wow, wow. Right, all the clothes taken off, I see. Cool. I am yours. Do with me what you will. I think we'll take you back to Rome. You will be the crowning glory of the triumph... The Senate will now give me that my victory in Gaul is complete. Triumph? A big parade that we Roman generals get when we've been super awesome, as I have been. There'll be games in my honour, and the people will line the streets to celebrate my brilliance and welcome me home. Soldiers, put Vercingetorix in chains, and for God's sake, get him some trousers. Wait, what about the women and children of Elysia? What about the rest of my warriors? What about them? Will you show them mercy? Why would I do that? Be- because I surrendered. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, don't get your point. I, the leader of my people, have surrendered to save the lives of the men, women and children who are starving to death because of your siege. What a silly thing to do. Soldiers, take him away. Thus Caesar secured his victory and didn't show any mercy at all to the poor men, women and children of Elysia who were all starved to death anyway. History people are so awful. While Caesar was convinced that his victory had done more than enough to secure him a triumph, some members of the Senate had other ideas. See there, good chum, a messenger has arrived from Rome. He says... He has correspondence from the Senate. Ah, it's probably about my triumph. I do hope Beyonce sings. Send him in. Ah, here he is now. Well then, speak up, young man. I have been sent to tell you that Consul Pompey and the Senate order you to disarm and return to Rome. I'm also to tell you that your governorship is over and so remaining in command of your army would be an act of treason. I beg your pardon? That was the message I was given, General. Please don't, you know, blame the messenger. It would be a total cliché. And then everyone would be like, that Caesar is so clichéd. And what not, probably. But Caesar has earned a triumph. He's conquered Gaul. We've conquered Gaul. Did you conquer Gaul? See, now, now, this is what I was worried about. Your tone is very aggressive. I really must stress that my only involvement in this whole thing is carrying a message from point A to point B. Well, it's a bit jolly rude of you to tell Caesar he can't have a triumph. (laughs) I should have you flocked. But I just say the words I've been paid to say. I'm not saying Caesar can't have a triumph, am I? It's Pompey and the Senate. Do you think Caesar should have a triumph? Well, I don't know, do I? I've been back in Rome. From what I hear, Pompey thinks you've got too big for your boots and the Senate, they're terrified of you. I think they've decided to put you in your place so you don't march your army back, take Rome by force and install yourself as a new dictator or something. Well, I wasn't going to, but I am now. Oh, really? We're going to, uh, cross the Rubicon. Why did you say it like that? Like what? Like it's got capital letters, and you paused for dramatic effect before you said it, lending the phrase even greater import. Hey, it's a big deal, isn't it? If we're gonna cross 
the Rubicon. You did it again! It means we'll be crossing the Rubicon River and setting foot in Italy with an army, which actually is an act of treason. Oh, I don't know about treason, fever, old boy. I've heard it's pretty naughty. It's only treason if you lose, gentlemen. You, messenger. Yes, sir. Give this message to Pompey and the Senate. Tell them that I'm coming back to Rome now. And if my triumph isn't ready to go when I get back, I will cross the Rubicon. Nice. With my soldiers, and then march into the city. Next, we will march to the Senate, and I will kill every senator that I can find, and then I will have my triumph. Got it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Triumph or killing, then triumph. Good. Off you go. And so Caesar gathered his forces and marched towards Rome. He only took one of his legions with him, knowing it would be more than enough for the show of force he was planning to make. Well, here we are at the Rubicon. Anyone else see anything that looks like a triumph? Or failing that, a carbonated fruit beverage? We've had no messengers, boss. I don't think they're going to do it. Are you sure you want to do this, Fever? Crossing into Italy with an army is one of those point-of-no-return type thingies. I made myself perfectly clear, didn't I? Didn't I? All they have to do is give me a massive triumph. I've earned it, and now I expect my dues. It's an insult. That's what it is. You've expanded the footprint of the Republic more than any man in living memory. They owe you big time, if you ask me. I just think that maybe we should leave the army here. Check first, you know. (laughs) You never know. We we might get to Rome, and then everyone jumps out and out. Surprise! (laughs) And give you your triumph. It's not a birthday party. I know that, Mark Antony. I'm just trying to avoid us doing a treason. They've had their chance. Very well. We cross the Rubicon. Let the die be cast. Oh, that's good. That's the kind of line that gets remembered, that is. Sorry, I got distracted. Did you say, the die is cast? Or, let the die be cast? It was definitely one of those two. We'll let the historians decide. And so it was that in 50 BC, Caesar marched his army across the Rubicon and into Italy. Upon arriving at Rome, he found that the Senate had fled and that Pompey had retreated to gather his legions and prepare for a civil war. Caesar had himself made dictator, used his emergency powers to install Mark Antony as his master of the horse, or second in command, and then, after 11 days, gave up his dictatorship and set off to pursue Pompey, leaving Mark Antony in charge of Rome. Caesar followed Pompey to Spain, then to Illyria, and finally to Greece. Many dramatic and exciting battles that we don't have time to cover in detail happened throughout the next two years. But it was at Pharsalus in Greece, on the 9th of August, 48 BC, that Caesar finally dealt Pompey's army a decisive blow. Pompey fled the field and headed to Egypt, where he hoped his fame and notoriety would bring the pharaoh to protect him. Egypt at last! Caesar will never catch us here! At last we are safe! Uh, You two, over there! I am Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, Consul of Rome. Take me to the Pharaoh. Um, don't know if we can, actually. Why not? Because, well, this. Oh, you stabbed me! He did. Sorry about that. The Pharaohs decided to throw his lot in with Caesar, seeing as he's just crushed your army and seized control of the Senate. Well... Bit rude, really. Now I'm bleeding profusely. Do you know who I am? Pompey, you just told us that. Oh, uh, yeah. I did, didn't I? Yeah, man. It's the whole reason I stabbed you, if I'm being honest. Well, I suppose you have your orders. Still, you've stabbed me now. Carried out your duty and whatnot. So let's forget about all of this and move on. Ah, oh, ah, oh, man. Like, I wish I could, mate, but... How the mighty fall. I wouldn't be falling if you chaps weren't stabbing me. We've got... 
orders! Yes, yes, I heard you the first time. I'm just saying, if you stop stabbing me for a minute, we could talk this out like honourable men. You're right. There's only one way to sort this out properly. Whoa, whole head off with one swing. My skills, bro. Thanks, man. Gotta love what you do. Caesar followed Pompey to Egypt, and when he arrived, he was taken to the throne room of the 14-year-old pharaoh, Ptolemy XIII. So this is Julius Caesar. I've heard a lot about you. Welcome to Egypt. You are most kind, pharaoh. But I shan't bother you over much. I've just come to get Pompey, and then we'll be heading back to Rome. Well, you won't be waiting long. We've already got him for you. Slaves, bring in Pompey! A silver platter covered by a silver bowl was placed on a table in front of Caesar. There must be some mistake. I'm not staying for dinner. Lift the bowl, Caesar. It's a present for you. Okay. Caesar lifted the lid. What? By the gods! Ho oh, ho! That's nasty! The severed head of Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus stared up at Caesar from the platter with dead eyes and a lolling tongue. Do you like it, Caesar? My advisor told me this would be most pleasing to you. Who did this? I had a couple of my men do it as soon as Pompey arrived here. Would you like to meet them? Yes, I rather think I would. Slaves, send in Achilles and Lucius Septimius. Hello, nice to meet you, Caesar. I see him. It's an honour. So... You're the ones who killed my friend, are you? We are, sir, yes. Hang on. Did you just see a friend? I did. This man was one of the finest generals Rome has ever had, and you butchered him like a hog on market day. Well, technically, you know, Lucius did. Dude! I just stabbed him, you know, once. It was barely a scratch, in all honesty. Lucius cut his head off. I mean, I tried to stop him, but, well, you know... You are the worst friend ever. Just laying some truth on the situation, bro, mate. I'm going to have these two men taken away. You will not. They are my men and... Still your tongue! I've half a mind to turn you over my knee, boy, and tan your backside. You can't talk to me like that. I'm the pharaoh. If I wanted to, whelp, I'd have you skinned and wear you as a god's damned cape. Now be quiet. The grown-ups are talking. Um, uh, please don't kill us, Caesar. We were only doing as we were told. Remove these wretches from my sight and execute them immediately. As you command, Lord Caesar. Oh, come on, man. We were just following orders. I don't know what to tell you, mate. Now I'm following orders. Oh, dude. The horrific arrow. Well, Caesar... I got your lovely gross head present and you've thrown it right back in my face. You can now consider Egypt an independent country. Our grain will no longer be feeding the people of Rome. Your grain will feed whoever I say it will feed. Speak to me like that again and I might start thinking about a change of management in these parts. You can't do that! Watch me. Did someone say change of management? What? What on earth is the matter? You're a... you're a girl. Bear Bear, Tombo, Bilbo. Is something afoot? I heard the commotion. What's happening? What's going on, Bob Bum? There's... there's a girl. Of course there's a girl. You asked me to be on the show. Yeah, we thought a character as iconic as Cleopatra shouldn't be played by, well, Tom. So we asked Lara to come in and be her. But it's the silly history, boys. What's your point? No one told me there would be a girl. I haven't brushed my hair or combed my teeth or anything. Don't pretend you brush your hair. Folks, are we doing the scene? This is seriously eating into my game time. Would it make you more comfortable if we pretend I'm a boy? Yes, yes it would. Hello, I'm Larry, a boy. Nice to meet you, Larry. So, can we get on with the scene now? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, where, 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 where were we? Cleopatra just came in and said, Did someone say change of management? Oh, yes, yes, I remember, I remember. I did. Who are you? 
Cleopatra, nice to make your acquaintance. Sister wife, I've told you to stay away from my throne room. I'll go where I like, brother husband. Hold on, are you two married? Unfortunately, yeah. But you're also brother and sister? What's your point? I think my main point is... Got to keep the blood pure, haven't you? Mm, That's how we roll in Egypt. Our mum is also our aunt. And grandma. Wow, of all the horrible, disgusting stuff I've seen in my military service, this really takes the placenta. I think I'm going to be sick. Does that mean you'll get out of my country? It certainly does not. In fact, seeing as you had Pompey killed, I think I'm going to make Cleopatra queen instead of you. Thank you very much, Caesar. Hey, that's not fair. I don't really care. At least she's a grown-up. Men, get Caesar and my sister wife immediately. Uh Uh-oh. Quick, Caesar. Come with me this way. I know how we can escape. Stop them! They're getting away! The land of Egypt erupted into civil war. Caesar and Cleopatra held the city of Alexandria, and Ptolemy's forces put them under siege. You, legionary, where's Caesar? He's in here, sir, with Cleopatra. Yeah, they're they're planning how to break the siege. (laughs) Doesn't sound like much planning is going on. Been in there for hours, sir. I'm guessing the planning must be really (laughs) in-depth. I guess I'll leave them to it, then. This is, after all, a family-friendly show. The siege of Alexandria lasted throughout December 48 BC and into the next year. Eventually, Caesar outwitted his opponent and crushed the forces of Ptolemy the Thirteenth at the Battle of the Nile in 47 BC. And there! Victory is ours! Cleopatra, you will be Queen of Egypt, I will head back to Rome, and we can enjoy a fruitful relationship between our two nations. Lovely! Thanks very much, Caesar! But I'm the Pharaoh! Not anymore, you're not! What are we going to do with my brother husband, Caesar? I'm worried that he'll try and overthrow me. A fine point, my dear. Tell me, Ptolemy. What? Can you swim? Of course I can't swim. I have slaves to do swimming for me. Right. That makes things easier. What do you mean? I mean this. <clears throat> ah! There we go. Sorted. Wonderful. Caesar, I've got some news. Oh, really? What's that, then? I'm going to have your baby. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. A smashing day. With victory secured in Egypt, Caesar could now head back to Rome. There was still some resistance from elements of the Senate and Pompey's remaining supporters, but Caesar soon dealt with them. His victory at the Battle of Thapsus in 46 BC saw an end to his senatorial opponents, including the Senator Cato, who committed suicide after the battle. Shortly afterwards, Caesar heard that Pompey's sons had fled to Spain and were raising an army to oppose him. And so, in March 45 BC, Caesar met with them at the Battle of Munda and destroyed them. This was the last battle, which became known as Caesar's Civil War. Caesar was appointed dictator for ten years and made consul, uh, but this time without another one. Now that Caesar had control of the Senate, he started making changes to how the Republic was governed. Why have you caught me here, Cassius? Because something needs to be done about Caesar, Brutus. Kimber, tell him. Caesar's ruining everything. It used to be that we rich landowners, the aristocracy, had the power in the Senate, but now he's making anyone and and everyone a senator. He just made a load of Gauls, senators. Gauls! I think he's done it so that all the different regions Rome controls feels like they have a fair representation within their republic. Exactly! He's doing it wrong! Romans should be the ones making all the decisions, not every Thomas, Dickus and Harry. Now he's introduced a new calendar based off the sun! It's madness! It was getting a bit confusing at first, but we're getting into the swing of it. (laughs) It's certainly not worth getting worked up about. He's reformed how debt is dealt with, wiped out nearly a quarter of all debt he has. 
And he's made a police force. Now you can't even wander the streets of Rome for fear of not being beaten to death by street gangs. And how is any of that bad? He's setting himself up to be king. Oh, that's what's bad. He even had that oaf, Mark Antony, place a crown on his head the other day. The only reason he refused it and took it off is because the crowd started booing. If they hadn't booed, he'd still be wearing it, I guarantee. No, we are a republic, ruled by the people. The rich people. And we will not tolerate being ruled over by a tyrant. Then why on earth did we all just vote to make him dictator for life? Hardly a surprise with all those smelly Gauls in there. They outnumber us ten to one. He can do what he likes and we can't stop him. Not politically, anyway. So, there's only one choice. And what choice is that, hmm? We kill him. What? We can't kill Caesar. Why, why he's my good chum. Oh, you won't be saying that when he decides. We all have to give up our land, so his soldiers have got somewhere to build farms. I don't think he said that at all. Not yet, he hasn't, but you watch. Soon, the Senate will be even more full of undesirable types. Like poor people. You. Poor people. They're the worst. Hmm. You have a point there. Poor people are rubbish. Can't have them in control. Filthy mudbloods. <laughs> we need things to go back to how they used to be. We aristocrats giving long speeches in the Senate and then voting for whatever gets us the most amount of money the fastest. And the only way to do that is kill Caesar. It can't just be one man either. We need a big group of us all in on it so that the plebs will know we've done it for their benefit. Is it for their benefit? Gods, no. But the mob will believe us. Whatever we tell them once it's done. I'm not so sure about this. Brutus, do you love the Republic? Of course I do. And you love having loads of land, power and money? Yes, yes, and certainly yes. Caesar will take all of it away if we don't stop him. We must stop him. It's the right thing to do. I suppose you're right. Caesar has lost sight of what the Republic is. We'll do it at the next meeting of the Senate. And when is that? The Ides of March. Ah, the Ides of March, yeah. <clears throat> and when is that? 15th March. We're holding it in the theatre of Pompey. BYOD. Bring your own dagger. And so the plot was made. Actually, it happened nothing like this and took months of planning, but this episode is really starting to get on, so we've squeezed it down to one scene. Anyway. And so the plot was made. The Ides of March came, and Caesar stepped into the theatre of Pompey. Good morning, gentlemen. Ah, Caesar. There you are. I'd very much like to discuss the petition to bring my brother back from exile. I don't have time for that now, Tylius Kimber. I'm afraid I must insist. Get off my tunic, Kimber! Why, this is violence! What's that? What's that dagger for, Casca, you villain? Ha! Ow! Get him! Stem him up a notch! Ooh. Ow! 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 Blimey! Ow! Oh, that was one of my bum bum! That's awful! Ow! 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 Is anyone counting? Ow! 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 Oh, so very, very stabbed. Anyone else? I think you guys have made your point. Oh, Caesar, old bean. Popping off those fingers, even to the last. And you, Brutus? Sorry, dear boy. Can't have you killing the Republic now, can we? Hmm? Ah! Is he... is he dead? I think so. What do we do now? Tell the people they are free? Well, that's, that's an excellent plan, Brutus. You go and do that and we'll... We'll go through that door over there and we will tell... Tell them all. All the way, whatever they may look like, through that door. We're going to tell them. Oh, we're going to tell them so hard. You're running away, aren't you? Yep. Yoink! And so Brutus ran into the streets of Rome to tell the people how they were now free. 
But the newly liberated people of Rome had retreated inside their homes and locked the doors because some people had just murdered the guy in charge. Brutus and the rest of the Libidores, as they called themselves, soon found out that people had actually been quite big fans of Caesar. The next few years would not go well for any of them. But that is a tale for another day. Have we fixed the timeline, then? Well, I reckon so. Hang on, I'll check Wikipedia. Ooh, look at that. All fixed. Well, hooray. Next time we'll just do the history thing straight off, shall we? No more fooling around with the rules of time and space. Yes. I have learned my lesson. Or have I? Yes, I have. Until next time, dear listener, we have been the Silly History Boys. And as ever, we are... Sorry! Sorry. Sorry. Silly History Boys, episode 12, or Caesar 3, A Man for All Seasons, was written and produced by the Silly History Boys. Gaius Julius Caesar and Goal 372 were played by me, dear Uncle Bob Bob. Mark Antony, Tylius Kimber, a Roman legionary, the assassin Lucius Septiminus, and Goal 53 were played by Will, Uncle Bilbo Fiscal. Brutus, a Roman legionary, the assassin Achilles, and Vercingetorix were played by Tom, Tombo Thermal. And Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, Cassius Longinius, various Roman soldiers, and Gaul 3426 were played by Stu, the Pear Bear Perry. You should have seen all the recent RADA graduates lining up to be Gauls. A queue went round the block. I was socially distanced, obviously. Ptolemy the 13th, Pharaoh of Egypt, it's pronounced Ptolemy, were played by Harry Hazmat Perber and introducing Lara Larry Bradburn as Cleopatra. Thanks, Larry. A real stand up bloke and a sort of Oliver Reed, young Patrick Stewart, proper, proper trained hell raising actor. <laughs> Thanks so much, Larry. The music was provided by Rob Lord Fastfingers Tristram. Extra special effects were from the lovely folks at zapsplat.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. Or, even better, tell a person. Perhaps make them a client king. March your army into their little setup and, 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 and slowly start to chip, chip away at their, at their sovereignty by building nice straight roads and having shields over your heads and holding your shields upside down like a suitcase and, and, and stabbing people with short, short, gladius swords. Right, that's everything I know about Romans. Apart from C-sections and salads, but... It's gone on far too long already. Ah, I suppose I've got my trousers back on now.